Every revolution starts in the minds of the people. Arm yourself for the war of ideas. Take back your life. Take back your liberty. Tom Mullen Talks Freedom. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Tom Mullen Talks Freedom. Today, I want to talk a little bit about where we are with the now 21-month-old coronavirus hysteria that has gripped not only the entire nation, but the world. And where we are is not in a good place. I know there are some green shoots, as Larry Kudlow used to say about the economy on his uh, financial show. We've got town supervisors resisting mask mandates. We have Robert Kennedy's book, The Real Anthony Fauci, a, a bestseller. Also, Alex Berenson's great book, Pandemia, is out and selling. I mean, these are all great signs, but at the same time, I, I don't think where we are is in a good place because we still have a large part of the population not only going along with what I call the COVID regime, but fiercely defending it, excoriating their fellow citizens for even questioning the effectiveness of lockdowns or mask mandates, much less the vaccines. I think there's another whole part of the population who probably knows deep down that there's not much to the science behind any of, the, of those measures, but that if they just keep their head down and go along to get along, that we'll get through this. And there's even been some headlines that say maybe the end is in sight. Maybe the Omicron variant is going to turn out to be far more contagious, but far less deadly, like most viruses evolve into something that can spread faster and not kill the hosts, which enables it to spread faster. I mean, that's just the way most viruses go. But I would caution people against being too optimistic because in a lot of ways, the damage has already been done. It has now been established as normal for state governors to close down their entire populations, to close businesses, to close churches, to lock people in their homes in some cases, and even to mandate mask wearing, which has a social cost and is, is not a healthy practice to do month after month, now year after year. This is all for a virus with a mortality rate of less than 1%. And just by way of comparison, the Spanish flu of 100 years ago had a mortality rate of 10%. 500 million people were infected worldwide and 50 million people died. So it was more than 10 times as deadly as COVID-19. Yet the measures that they employed against it were far less severe. According to Western New York Heritage Magazine here in Western New York, in the city of Buffalo, there was a quarantine implemented in the city. It lasted from October 10th to November 1st. That's one day over three weeks to flatten the curve of the Spanish flu. But if we're going to allow governors and county executives to institute these kinds of measures over something as mild as COVID-19, then we're going to be seeing this every year. And just like everything else the government does that doesn't work, it's never going to go away, not unless we make it go away. And I thought I would just offer a few examples from history to put some perspective on the COVID regime, the lockdowns, the mass mandates, the anti-social distancing, oops. Um, it's been pretty firmly established that these had no effect on the spread of the virus. For anyone who doubts that, I'll post some links on the show notes page, including the COVID charts quiz by that other Tom, the great Tom Woods, who took the time and resources to have this put together to show people you can look at states that went full lockdown, full mask, full insanity against COVID-19 and states just next door that didn't do anything. And the results are either the same or perhaps the states that did not do anything did a little bit better. But just like everything else in the new normal, the government does not want you to believe your own eyes. Don't look at those charts that show that Iowa, for example, did no worse 
than the other seven Midwest states that all had lockdowns while Iowa was wide open. Don't believe the numbers you see that show that Florida has a similar mortality to New York, even though Florida has far more old people and has a much lower mortality rate once you adjust for age, even though Florida was wide open and New York, even in December of 2021, still has a statewide mask mandate. What they're doing is in no way different from what O'Brien does to Winston Smith in 1984, where he tortures him for weeks or months to get him to say that when O'Brien held up four fingers, he was actually holding up five. And he didn't just want Winston Smith to say it, to say what his own eyes said was not true. He insisted and tortured Smith until he actually believed it. And it's not hyperbole to say that's what's going on with the COVID regime. It should be terrifying to everybody. But getting back to why I say that we shouldn't be too optimistic about the future, even if for some period of time the COVID insanity does end, it's going to be back. There's going to be a different virus. And this is going to be the way things are from now on, a miserable way to live putting on masks wherever you go at the order of some bureaucrat, perhaps closing your business without any notice, they will continue to do this until we make them stop. Now, why do I say that? Because all of history says that's true. Now, the first example of what I'm talking about is the oldest libertarian joke in the world. You know, what about Marauds? Not exactly sure what the M-U-H before Rhodes is supposed to mean, but I know it's kind of a way to denigrate the typical objection to libertarianism, which is, oh, I suppose that you don't use the government's roads, implying that without the government providing them, there would be no roads whatsoever. Well, anybody who's ever read a book probably knows that for the first 80 years, almost all of the roads were privately funded, owned, and operated by corporations set up for that purpose. In fact, I'd like to share something also from Western New York Heritage Magazine about a town you may have heard of, even if you're not from Western New York, called Orchard Park. It's where the Buffalo Bills play. Well, I'll bet even most of the people who live in Orchard Park don't know that that town is a population center, along with the towns of Hamburg and many of the other what we call South Towns here in the Buffalo, New York area because of a man named Alan Potter, who built the first road from Buffalo out to what was then called East Hamburg, New York, now Orchard Park, New York. I'd like to read a little passage from the article in the magazine about Potter. And it starts out with the first, what they used to call Plank Road, being built in Michigan. Plank roads were at the time a technological improvement over the dirt roads that most people were used to outside of the major cities. And I'll share with you this passage. It reads, a relatively new phenomenon in the US, the first plank road had been built in the late 1830s in Michigan, with a second such road being constructed near Syracuse in the mid 1840s, just as the Buffalo Creek lands were being dispersed. Such a road consisted of two longitudinal sets of wooden rails laid parallel to each other at a distance of about four feet. A series of eight-foot planks was then laid across these stringers, as they were called, with an earthen shoulder being built up on each side to stabilize the whole thing while providing a rudimentary space for passing. Certainly crude by modern standards, plank roads represented a significant improvement over the unpaved thoroughfares that were still the norm in rural areas. And since the construction and maintenance of a plank road was a significant expense, tolls were charged for using them, providing those with the foresight and wherewithal an attractive business opportunity. Perhaps predictably, Alan Potter was one of the men to seize upon such an opportunity and thus was at the forefront of the move to connect the rural communities in the South with Buffalo. And he had good reason to do so as the tavern he owned up until 1843 sat alongside the logical route while his other business concerns were nearby. By 1848, he had become the primary moving force and manager of the East Hamburg Turnpike Company. According to Orchard Park historian Suzanne Culp, 
The road began on the southeast side of Buffalo with a toll gate branching off at Abbott Road near the current site of Mercy Hospital. Not surprisingly today, the road is still known as Potter's Road. Continuing east-southeast past what is now I-90, it followed the path of modern Orchard Park Road, Route 240, turning into a more southerly direction at Ridge Road where a second toll gate was located. From there, it continued to follow modern Route 240, passing over Smoke Creek and through Webster's Corners before reaching the crossroads at Potter's Corners. From that point, it continued south a bit farther, linking up with what would become the Cataraugus and Buffalo Plank Road, begun in 1849, at the modern intersection of Chestnut Ridge and New Armour Roads, routes 277 and 240. Now, I wanted to provide that detail, even though it doesn't mean a lot to people who aren't familiar with the local area, because I wanted to show, first of all, how extensive the road system that Potter built was, and also to point out that this was a real thing. These roads were useful. In fact, they were indispensable at the time for connecting people who lived in these areas with the city. And notice something else that the article says the reason that Potter got into this was partly for public service, but it just so happens that the roads were going to go by many of his existing businesses. He started out as a tavern owner and later got into real estate and several other businesses, all which were going to benefit from these new roads coming from Buffalo out to the Orchard Park area. Notice also that the article calls him the primary moving force and manager of the East Hamburg Turnpike Company, but he wasn't the only one involved. Typically, these turnpike companies would be formed by groups of businessmen in a particular area who knew that they would benefit from roads being built between their businesses and some other destination. Now, these corporations weren't always extremely profitable. They were always profitable enough to stay in business. But there were other benefits, and this just goes to show, yeah, the old question, would we have roads without the government? Absolutely, we would, we did, and we can again. In fact, Alexis de Tocqueville, in his famous book, Democracy in America, specifically commented on how the roads were built by private firms in America as part of his larger observation of how many things that governments provided in other countries were provided by voluntary associations in America. And Seymour Dunbar's History of Travel in America, published in 1915, he says the following, Many of the toll road franchises have only lapsed in recent years, and a few are still effective. Maryland and perhaps other states yet possess toll gates. Not until after the Civil War did various commonwealths generally adopt a policy under which roadways were considered public works to be created and maintained by the people themselves and used without toll fees. Now, when Dunbar says the people themselves, he means the government. But it's interesting that even as late as 1915, there were still privately owned and operated roads in much of America. Not that there aren't a few here and there yet today. And it wasn't a matter that there was some dire concern that we needed to have the government build these roads. This is something that a particular political movement had been after since the days of Alexander Hamilton. A big part of Hamilton's system was government infrastructure. They used to call it internal improvements. And his Federalist Party had three main planks, high protective tariffs to supposedly help American manufacturing, internal improvements, which means the government collects taxes and builds roads and canals in his time, and a central bank. So this was a Federalist program until their party petered out in the 1820s, and they were replaced by the Whigs, led by Henry Clay, who had the same quote-unquote American system, it's what Clay called it, wanted the same things, high protective tariffs, government-provided infrastructure, and a central bank. 
Now, just like the Federalists, they failed to normalize government infrastructure. It was always considered unconstitutional for the federal government to be building anything. And those few projects that were built by the states, as far as roads or canals were concerned, were all disasters. So it wasn't out of any superiority in government road building that they gradually were taken over by the government. In fact, it was Lincoln, who was a lifelong Whig before the Republican Party was formed, who finally was able to have the government start doing the things that Henry Clay had always hoped that it would do. And of course, in Lincoln's time, this meant subsidizing the railroads. Now, most of that occurred after Lincoln was dead during the Republican domination of American politics after the Civil War. But it's really an accident of history that they were able to dominate for so long only because they were the, the anti-slavery party. So they were able to get all the abolitionists together in a coalition with these government infrastructure people and finally realize their dream of the government taking this over. As one more side note, I will say that as awful as the Confederates were, they really didn't need to change the Constitution much when they adopted their own constitution and forming the Confederacy. So they pretty much used the U.S. Constitution as their template. And the, the big difference that they made is they put in a provision saying, by no means does this government have the power to do what we would now call infrastructure or internal improvements. So if there was one good thing about the Confederacy, it was at least they recognized the government shouldn't be building roads. Okay, everyone, let's take a quick break for this important message. It's that time of the year again when we're all looking for something special to give friends and loved ones for the holidays. Unfortunately, the government and its bank have worked especially hard this year at doing what they do best, make things more expensive for the rest of us. Well, I have great news. You can get a free copy of my new ebook, An Anti-State Christmas, that's my gift to you in appreciation for listening. But that's not all. I've also made the book available as a paperback at an incredibly low price, so you can get a few copies to give as gifts. It makes a great stocking stuffer. And don't worry, this is not some preachy libertarian treatise. It's full of fun and even includes a special Christmas beverage recipe. Get more information and your free ebook at antistatechristmas.com. Just ain't true. We help each other when we don't mean to. That's what we call the invisible hand. Something no politician understands. Just leave it up to supply and demand. So, why did I take so much time to go through all that history about road during an episode about COVID 19 and the COVID regime? because I wanted to illustrate how the government really gets involved in things. It's not because there's some crying need or some outcry from the public. Rather, a minority of the population that has a statist worldview will see something that's imperfect, like the private road system, and agitate for the government to take it over. Now, what is the result in almost every case? the government does a much worse job than the private sector was doing. And the roads are a perfect example. What we put up with on our modern government road system is absolutely indefensible. The idea that we could have stretches of road under construction for years at a time, and you drive by day after day and you can't see anyone working on them. Just as one example, I lived in Tampa, Florida from 2004 to 2014. And just after I moved there, they started a road construction project on Route 275. This was about a three-mile stretch of road between the airport and downtown Tampa. Anybody who's familiar with the area knows where I'm talking about. They started this project in late 2004. When I moved back to New York State in 2014, it was still not finished. I don't think it was finished until at least a year after that, maybe more. It is finished now. But 10 years for three miles. And during this time, you had to experience massive delays that could not handle the volume of traffic. And I also traveled for business for most of the 21st century up until the corona hysteria began. And I can tell you that driving in almost every state in this union, 
You can't go more than five or six minutes in any city or more than an hour on any of the interstate highways without encountering some significant delay on a construction project that very often no one is working on. This is not normal. This is not something that would occur with a private owner of that road who's losing money every minute that that road's not at full capacity. And make no mistake, this is exactly the kind of thing that happened with government road and canal projects in the first half of the 19th century. And this is the reason that people who oppose them cited for not wanting the government to have anything to do with building roads. But what happened? The government took it over and people just got used to poor quality, higher prices, and general misery in using the road system. And this is the same story over and over again. The government wasn't always involved in education or college education and guaranteeing people loans to make them more affordable. Well, let me tell you, people used to work their way through college. They used to get a summer job and be able to get enough money together to pay their tuition. Maybe they got some voluntary help from the university or the college, and that's how they did it if they didn't have enough money to pay everything up front. That's impossible today. Nobody could pay college tuition on what they make at a summer job. This is the result of the government taking it over. Now we just live with it. Now we just consider it normal. It's not normal. The same thing at the airport. We didn't used to have the TSA. I don't know how old you have to be to remember what it used to be like to go through the airport, but it was nothing like the misery you go through and getting through security and then all of the ridiculous announcements they make supposedly to keep us safe from terrorism and now I'm sure COVID as well. So this is a repeating pattern. The government finds something new to get into. It's a total failure. Just like the war on drugs, the Department of Education, the road system, healthcare in general, you know, it's more affordable now, right? And the population somehow just learns to live with the misery that the government creates. And I'm telling you that this COVID regime is going to be no different. If we do not stop this now, plan our feet hard and refuse to go along, this is going to be one more bit of misery we're going to have to live with. And I'd say that it's an order of magnitude worse than even the roads, the airport, the schools, etc. Now, as I've said before, our forefathers bled and died for freedom. None in our lifetime, because we certainly didn't have to fight the Koreans or the Vietnamese, much less the Iraqis or the Afghans for our freedom. Our freedom wasn't under threat in those wars. But at least back in the Revolutionary War, the United States were invaded by the British and people had to die to preserve the political system that they had chosen. Well, we don't have to take bullets for our freedom today, but we may have to put up with some inconvenience and even some economic hardship. We've got to start saying no. We've got to be willing to boycott businesses that go along with this. Hey, if you own a business and you feel like you're between a rock and a hard place, I get it. Guess what? Life isn't fair. It's not a choice between going along and waiting until this is over. It's never going to end unless we end it. The TSA just celebrated their 20th anniversary. They've never caught a terrorist. They fail their own tests by over 90%. They're never going away. Education keeps getting more expensive, less affordable, directly because of the involvement of the government in it. The Department of Education is never going away. The COVID regime is never going away unless we make it go away. And we're going to have to take a very firm, peaceful, but firm stand against it. We're going to have to start saying no. We're going to have to resist. As Senator Rand Paul said, they can't arrest us all. They're not even going to try to arrest us. Believe me, when you say no to these bullies, they don't have the backbone that the British did in 1775. These are weak, spineless bureaucrats who are terrified by microaggressions. A harsh word sends them scurrying. So my message today is stand your ground, refuse to comply, refuse to subsidize anyone who helps perpetuate this nightmare or we're going to be living in it for the rest of our lives, and so will our children. It's now or never. Okay, friends, that's going to do it for today. 
Don't forget to get a free copy of my new ebook, An Anti State Christmas, at antistatechristmas.com. Of course, if you haven't already, subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you normally listen. And please do go to the Tom Mullen Talks Freedom website at tommullentalksfreedom.com and leave a review. And if you like the music you've heard on Tom Mullen Talks Freedom, you can hear more at tommullensings.com. Thanks for listening. The war of ideas has only just begun. Arm yourself with the knowledge you need by heading to TomMullenTalksFreedom.com and subscribing to our email list. And remember, every revolution starts in the minds of the people.